The story of labor is the story of North America. You may not have heard it before or read about it in school, but it's as important as the Louisiana Purchase or the Confederation of Canada. All across North America, labor built this mighty country, from the roads we travel on to the clothes we wear. The eight-hour work day, the 40-hour work week, health benefits, pension benefits, safety laws. All of these things are commonplace today because they were fought for and won by the men and women of this great movement. Our history is what we are. It's where we came from. It's how we got here. And uh, people need to know that. If they know that, I think that they have a better idea of what the union movement is about and what their union is about. And that is important today, especially more so than ever. To understand where you are and where you're going, you first have to know from where you came. Today, you'll learn the significance behind the story of labor and the role sheet metal workers have played and continue to play in it. We are North America. Unionism has its roots deep in our history, dating back long before the American Constitution was signed. The founding colonists were predominantly tradesmen. They had to be to build and construct a new society from scratch. They were carpenters and masons, glaziers and potters, weavers and tailors, and blacksmiths and whitesmiths. Those that worked in iron, of course, were called blacksmiths. Those that worked in the tin and related soft metals would be uh, considered whitesmiths. Whitesmiths were also known as tinsmiths and were the forefathers of the modern sheet metal workers. The whitesmith had a shop with tools similar to those of today, but with a lot less hand power. He had snips, of course, and he also had the usual array of hammers, dividers, pinchers, and an anvil-like block for hammering out metal. Much of the kitchenware that was used in Colonial uh, was made out of tinware. Much of the lighting had to be used with a tin, things to hold the whale oil, even the little stoves that were used were made out of a sheet metal. So all of this was part and parcel of the, uh, the trade of the, of the sheet metal workers. Most early tinsmiths, as they came to be called, traveled the countryside by wagon, peddling their wares and skills from town to town. They were mostly barterers, exchanging goods for items like rags, old pewter, brass, and copper, and yes, occasionally ready money. The idea of the tinker, the traveling tinsmith uh, or whitesmith uh, who went around with his little wagon selling goods that he had made, of course, was, was dying out. Along with the growth and expansion of North America came the growth and expansion of industry. As more and more people arrived on our shores, the need for new homes, new appliances, and other necessities of life increased, and businessmen were there ready and eager to supply them on the backs of working men and women. Nationally, you really had the most success in the period of the 1880s, the rise of the, of the large corporations uh, and the, the great uh, growth of wealth in the post-Civil War period, the so-called great barbecue of, uh, of uh, capitalism. Through the years, as workers combined their efforts to better themselves, we realized that the issues which claimed their attention were basically many of the same ones which rank at the top of our priority list today. Better wages, shorter hours, safer conditions, and the right to bargain collectively. The more people in your industry that are organized, the better and stronger your bargaining position. The pressure of government, manufacturers, ownership, not liking this and putting pressure on these organizations under the cons quote, conspiracy, the idea that these people were banding together, taking oaths, and the idea of oaths taking was seen as a, as a secret society that would undermine society itself. So this was used by the people who had the capital to destroy any movement towards a regional or national union uh, organizational structure. Working people in the eyes of business, I'm talking about big business, people with, with a lot of money and a lot of power, to them, we are their property. We are the, their property. They consider us their property. And uh, I have to tell you, I don't want to be anybody's property. In the early to mid-1800s, the first national trades organizations began to emerge. 
Most never lasted more than a year or so before falling to the constant anti-union pressures of the business owners and bosses. One organization, however, did succeed and became the first labor association strong enough to challenge industry. The Order of the Knights of Labor was open to all working men and women, regardless of their craft or skill level. It was truly a workers' organization, but this open inclusion, no matter how idealistic, would eventually lead to internal strife. You had assemblies of a particular craft, but then you had these mixed assemblies that created um, uh, sometimes disharmony within uh, and conflict within various trades. The Knights of Labor championed the eight-hour workday, the prohibition of child labor, and equal pay for the sexes. Eventually, however, most labor leaders, especially from the skilled trades, deemed the Knights' idealistic, non-confrontational philosophy ineffective. The internal discord would ultimately lead to the demise of the Order of the Knights of Labor. But before that would happen, an incident would occur in the city of Chicago that would shake the foundations of the labor movement and leave it struggling to survive. In 1886, you had the great violent catastrophe of the Haymarket riot, which was in Chicago. There was a strike at the McCormick Reaper Works. In addition, you had the push for the eight-hour day. The result, however, was that during a rally for or a protest demonstration ended up in a bomb being thrown. Even to this day, no one knows exactly who threw it or what the motivation was. The net result, though, was that there were eight policemen killed and a number of the people who were at the rally were killed by gunshots. Again, it was chaos. The fight for the eight-hour day and unionism in general was tarnished in the eyes of the public for years to come. The Haymarket riot became the industrialist symbol of violent opposition to American values. It would take a strong resolve for the movement to overcome that stigma. At that time, a newly formed Federation of Labor Unions was beginning to emerge, led by a cigar makers union leader by the name of Samuel Gompers. Gompers had been a member of the Knights of Labor, but was now ready to lead the movement in a new direction. With the establishment of the American Federation of Labor, Samuel Gompers sought to build the labor movement into a force powerful enough to transform the economic, social, and political status of America's workers. No easy task for a fledgling organization still reeling from the Haymarket fallout. Many members that actually founded the AFL were members of the Knights of Labor. They were both, but they saw more and more that this structure of the Knights would not work. Gompers advocated trade unionism that restricted union membership to wage earners and grouped workers into locals based on their trade or craft. He was convinced that the unions open to workers of all types of skills were too undisciplined to withstand the repressive tactics that both government and management had used to break unions. Then you had the AFL concept, which was that you really want to focus on the basics, wages, hours, working conditions. The broader scope is something you can't get without overturning society, which is just not going to happen. According to Gompers, unionism's sole task was to hammer out the best arrangement it could under the existing system, using strikes, boycotts, and negotiations. Under Gompers' stewardship, the AFL membership expanded to nearly 2 million members in just over 10 years. But he didn't do it alone. One man in particular had a great influence on the movement that is still felt today. Peter J. McGuire, the founder of the United Brotherhood of Carpenters and Joiners, was the first secretary of the AFL. He was a great speaker and a notorious and effective agitator, who today is remembered most notably as the father of Labor Day. It was his ingenious idea for workers to lead a festive parade through the streets of the city to garner support for the eight-hour day. More than 30,000 marchers participated in the first event in New York City. The event was a huge success and was instrumental in legitimizing the labor movement within society. With Gompers and McGuire leading the way, the AFL quickly became a powerful social economic force, forever changing the way government, industry, and labor interact. During these tumultuous times of social upheaval and industrial boom in the late 19th century, the labor movement held the line for working people. Unions fought for the rights and dignity of every underprivileged man, woman, and child in North America. Finally, trade workers of all crafts were realizing that only in unity is their strength. 
the time was ripe for organization. It was at this pivotal moment that an Illinois tinsmith by the name of Robert Kellerstrass began writing letters to the leaders of other tinners locals, calling for the creation of a national union. If a strong local gives the individual strength, a national organization will give the locals, and hence the members, even more strength. Robert Kellerstrass, February 1887. Kellerstrass's call for combining forces was greatly received, and on January 25, 1888, metal workers from around the country convened in Toledo, Ohio to, as Kellerstrass put it, better our conditions morally and socially. The delegates discussed matters of wages, hours and conditions, and labor relations, as well as current and future economic conditions. They also chose the first officers of the new union, electing Archibald Barnes of Kansas president, A.W. Chatfield of Missouri, secretary, and Kellerstrass as treasurer. Whereas we, the journeyman tin, sheet iron, and cornice workers from the various towns and cities of the United States, in convention assembled, having seen the necessity of a thorough organization of our trade, and that a common cause and universal sympathy with all who work at our trade demands of us to urge the immediate unity and consolidation of all the various organizations throughout the United States and Canada. We have formed this international association, believing as we do that it will serve our employers whilst it elevates our condition. The new organization would consist of seven original local unions numbered one through seven. The name of the new organization would be the Tin, Sheet Iron, and Cornice Workers International Association, a name that would change several times throughout the 20th century as new crafts were organized. In those early days, labor had few protections from lockouts by unfriendly employers or injunctions from hostile judges, and threats and outright beatings were commonplace from hired company thugs, who very often were moonlighting off-duty police officers. But that didn't deter the efforts of the founding members. The union's growth was nothing short of spectacular, expanding from seven locals in 1888 to 108 in less than 10 years. Included in that expansion was the historic chartering of the Canadian sheet metal workers in 1896, starting with Toronto's Local 30. This momentous unification across the border increased the strength of the union and solidified the IA's international reputation. The turn of the century marked the beginning of the most dynamic age of civilization the world has ever known. This century would see the mass production of automobiles, the birth of flight, two world wars, the splitting of the atom, and the creation of the computer. As civilization advanced, so did the labor movement and the sheet metal workers with it. New ideas for programs to protect and benefit our members were being developed. One of the first came in 1901. That year, the first death benefit program was introduced with its payments of $50 for a six-month membership, $100 for a year's tenure, and $150 for two years or more. It was programs like this that helped increase membership and our collective strength. The Young Union, with some 5,000 members, was chartered by the equally young American Federation of Labor, and so began to lend its support through the bitter strikes and lockouts that were so common then. Our official publication, The Journal, kept people informed about union business and labor news, like the importance of political action. We believe the day is past for labor organizations to neglect the ballot box. The time is at hand for the worker to free himself as he holds the remedy. Will he use it? If he will not, his plea for mercy shall fall on deaf ears. The Journal, February 1905. All in all, organized labor was making a difference. And maybe that's one reason so many people from across the Atlantic have come to North America's shores for the promise of liberty and opportunity, nearly 10 million by 1911. We were coming of age as countries and as a union. Our membership soon approached 20,000. Railroad workers and coppersmiths added to the numbers. Things were looking up. Then war struck. Victory came on November 11, 1918, but the celebration was brief. As the war machine slowed down, civilian jobs were hard to find. The Union tried to help ex-soldiers get a new start in life, but more than four and a half million had been in uniform. There simply weren't enough jobs to go around. In 1919, Prohibition just made things worse. 
thousands of coppersmiths who made kettles used in brewing and distilling lost their jobs. The hard times got even harder with the stock market crash of 29. Jobs evaporated. Every day, the depression grew deeper. Labor had to fight, not only to keep jobs, but to protect wages from cutbacks. Membership in the IA fell to 14,000. The union's journal stopped publishing, and union officers took pay cuts just to keep the doors open. Our greatest primary task is to put people to work. This nation is asking for action, and action now. That's what FDR said when he took office. And it started happening. There were strikes and problems with some of the government's back-to-work programs, but we started coming back. For men in the union, there were jobs in construction, as new buildings went up with modern heating, ventilating, and air conditioning systems. It wasn't easy, but we struggled to hold the union together. Then Europe exploded, and one more time there was a war to be fought. Sheet metal workers from the US and Canada, thousands of them did their part in uniform and in the factories. A lot of them joined defense construction battalions and went overseas. They carved airfields and military bases out of the jungles and forests, and many made history as America's fighting construction workers, the Seabees. By the time the war ended in 1945, the IA had more than 53,000 members and still needed more for all the work to be done. There was also a renewed interest in apprenticeship. That, coupled with the advancement of technology, led the IA leadership to standardize apprenticeship training across North America in 1946. So for the first time, there were specific training rules and regulations for all locals to follow, no matter where you went, from Nova Scotia to California. It was the dawning of a new era for our union. A new group insurance program was established, which covered medical care and life insurance, and even cash benefits for time lost. It was the first of its kind in the building trades. We had a president, his name was Robert Byron. He was uh, president of this union for almost 30 years. He probably saw more change. Uh, he went through the Depression era, the first or the Second World War, and saw a lot of that and what happened to the labor movement during that time. By the middle of the 1950s, the union had grown to nearly 90,000 members, plus some 11,000 apprentices, and there were close to 600 locals across the continent. A department of organization was created to coordinate efforts and to branch out into production industries. Our railroad shopmen were winning important victories both in the U.S. and Canada. In fact, the entire labor movement was feeling a growth spurt as the AFL merged with the Congress of Industrial Organizations and Canadian workers saw to the creation of the Canadian Labor Congress. Being born in the 50s, that was the, that was the good time. My dad was a sheet metal worker. He was a union sheet metal worker, and I never lacked for anything. We had probably the, the best time of our lives. That's not to say things were easy. The Eisenhower era was not friendly to labor. Right-to-work laws and the Landrum-Griffin Act became synonymous with anti-unionism. Those battles inspired our union to a new order of business. And as the decade of the 60s began, so did our new political organization, the Political Action League. As the newly elected president, John F. Kennedy brought with him into office a new optimism. Among his first acts was a bill allowing federal workers the right to collective bargaining. For us, it meant new organizing opportunities in Navy yards, air bases, and other facilities. And with the advent of the space age, our members were called into action once again. And so names like Shepard and Glenn took their place with Lindbergh as flyers who put their lives in the hands of Union sheet metal craftsmen. We had a general president by the name of Edward F. Carlo. He was business manager of Local 28 New York City. And uh, he was the first uh, person to ever negotiate a pension plan in a construction labor contract. So uh, we're, you know, and that's proud heritage. We're proud of that. We started the pensions. He started the pensions in the construction industry. In 1970, Edward F. Carlo retired after 11 years as general president. The members elected him as general president emeritus for all the new ideas he brought to the union. But Mr. Carlo's retirement didn't change the way the union worked. It still looked to the future with an eye towards innovation for growth and for the needs of its members. In an era of economic uncertainty, the union moved on to expand into emerging fields, such as testing and balancing, 
and work created by the new interest in the environment. To prepare members for new opportunities, we join forces with our contractors through SMACNA to create a national training fund. Its annual nationwide apprentice competition put our workers' skills on display for large audiences of potential workers. An ingenious program that tapped the tremendous enthusiasm of our young new members was developed to assist the organizing department in its recruiting of new members and new contractors. I served on a special committee that uh, put together the youth to youth program. So basically by doing this I am helping people. I'm helping myself, I'm helping my brotherhood, and I'm helping anybody I can get into it. Growing the union remained an imperative for the collective success of the international. As new members and new shops were organized, the IA adapted the numbering system of the locals to be more systematic. Low numbers for building trades locals and high numbers for production locals. And to help workers through the tough times, a controversial yet innovative stabilization fund called SASME was created, the potential of which would be realized in the lean Reagan years of the 80s. That extra money helps uh, a lot of families pay for their car and house and groceries and, uh, and so that they can continue to live uh, in, with some dignity. It's brothers and sisters helping brothers and sisters in a time of need. SASME and Youth to Youth were just two of the innovative programs created by IA General President Edward J. Carlo. Edward J. Carlo was one of the smartest individuals I ever knew. He believed in, the, in his heart and soul in the labor movement. He had the ability to put things together, programs together. He was the one that thought uh, up all of these uh, programs that we have in our union. In 1981, SMWIA members joined 400,000 of their brothers and sisters in Washington, D.C. for the first Solidarity Day protest against President Reagan's firing of striking air traffic controllers. This show of strength and unity gave inspiration to many in the beleaguered labor movement, which was under continuous attack from the Reagan administration. Going into the 80s, times became tougher for our, the tradesmen. The union movement starting to suffer. Management was finding all kind of ways to do away with us. We still worked at it, we still worked hard. The benefits were still there. With the election of Ronald Reagan and the firing of the aircraft controllers, it sort of gave free reign to the manufacturing and uh, business uh, opponents of labor using the legal maneuvers uh, could in fact uh, defeat any attempt by labor to, uh, to be effective. We've lost a lot since uh, about 1979 and people need to know that because you can lose it if you don't have an appreciation for it and a knowledge about how it all happened. The 80s were also a time of innovation and advancement, and nowhere was that more evident than within the sheet metal industry, where technology was changing the way sheet metal workers performed. The machinery and, and technology came on board and took a lot of our hands-on away from us. Now they bring in machines and they lift you up and other things lift the ductwork up. Today, you know, we have the laser cutters and the plasma tables, uh, the materials come out so much quicker that it's incredible. Technology wasn't the only field of advancement. The IA continually sought better ways to protect and care for its membership. By the middle of the decade, a new asbestos screening program was designed and implemented, saving thousands of lives. Our Shmoe program, uh, we, that started out of, uh, out of uh, doing uh, the asbestos screenings for our members. And when we started it off and started doing the screenings, we were actually saving people's lives. We had people that uh, they, they found cancer early enough that they were be able to cure, cure it. In 1988, the International Association celebrated its 100th anniversary. To commemorate this momentous occasion, world-famous architect Frank Gehry designed a fantastic structure entirely of sheet metal. The copper and brass house was erected and displayed in the National Building Museum. It was obvious that sheet metal pride was still strong. And yet the labor movement struggled through the Reagan years with diminishing membership and loss of market share for many crafts. The IA itself was not immune to these difficult times. When President Edward J. Carlo resigned in 1993, the IA leadership immediately shifted its focus internally working closely with the federal government to ensure the union's fiscal accountability. 
I, William Jefferson Clinton, do solemnly swear. With the election of Bill Clinton to the U.S. presidency came a renewed prosperity for working families. There. The IA continued to break new ground in training and education with the expansion of the National Training Fund into the International Training Institute. The uh, International Training Institute today developed programs to try and look to the future of what we're going to need in 5, 10, 15 years down the road so that we can have a lifetime career opportunity for our members. Recognized as the industry leader in post-secondary education, the Institute has also become the leader in industry certification. Having world certifications and uh, having those credentials really did uh, open a lot of doors. Certifications give us credibility in the industry and they give our members job opportunities. That's what we're supposed to do. The 21st century began with promise, a little hype, and a bit of apprehension. But soon, union families would settle in and get back to work. No one was prepared for what awaited them the morning of September 11, 2001. When the dust cleared and the shock slowly seeped away, it was the men and women of the labor movement who once again came to the call of their country, aiding in the rescue and recovery attempts, as well as the subsequent cleanup and rebuilding. The IA and its membership responded overwhelmingly, volunteering, donating blood, and pledging thousands of dollars to the relief fund. It was in this trying time that another innovative idea from the IA took shape, an idea that now seems ahead of its time. The National Center for Energy Management and Building Technologies was created as an industry research institution with the intention of improving the safety of indoor environments and creating policy for the benefit of public health, as well as advancing new technology and expanding education and knowledge. The center is another example of IA innovation and expertise leading the way for the sheet metal industry. We're actually making jobs for our members. The uh, International Training Institute, Mimi and Schmoet, are part of our Constitution. And the delegates said everyone uh, will participate in those programs because they were so key to the survival and the future of our industry. Our union has come a long way since its inception in 1888. Gone are the adversarial days of labor versus management. Today, the relationship with our contractors is one of partnership, shared commitment, and shared success. And so, our annual labor management conferences have become essential to the promotion of cooperation between the IA and our signatory contractors within SMACNA. These forums allow members and contractors to address potential problems, solidify details of joint programs, and generally prepare for the future of the industry together. Our world is constantly changing. One may wonder if those men in Toledo could have predicted that we would come this far, from steam power to nuclear power from rail travel to rocket travel. It's no exaggeration to say that union sheet metal workers have been a part of those changes every step of the way. There's a good future here for our membership and for young people. Uh, it's a lifelong opportunity to learn. It's a lifelong opportunity to change and it will allow you to go as far as you want. No one knows for sure what changes lie ahead, but thanks to the generations of sheet metal workers that came before us, we're prepared to lead the way.